the biblical view of a person on this edition of Truth and Love. Johnson, and you're listening to Truth and Love, a podcast of the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, where we seek to provide biblical solutions for the problems that people face. This week, I am thrilled to have with me Tim Pasma. He is a pastor at LaRue Baptist Church and has been, my goodness, Tim, for over 30 years. Yeah, 36. And man, he has six children. He's married to Becca, and they have 14 grandchildren. That's, that's quite envious have 14 grandchildren. It's a lot of fun. It is, I'm sure. And uh, he is an ACBC board member. He's been a certified member uh, with ACBC for quite some time. I'm so grateful for this brother and his wisdom and the spirit that he brings in relationship. I just, I love hanging out with our brother, Tim Pasma. And, and today, Tim, we're going to talk about a very important subject. When when I talk about some of the issues that that are constantly facing biblical counseling. They, they they really boil down to three, broadly, three, sufficiency of Scripture. We will always fight that battle. It, it'll be something that we're constantly talking about over and over and over again, that every generation will have its own way of trying to redefine it and so on. The second thing is ecclesiology, the way we think about the church, who God's people are, and our mission, what we've been called to do. And that's constantly under attack from the evil one. The the third thing, and really this is a major presentation in the world in which we live, is anthropology, the way that we think about people. I think one of the greatest detriments of modern psychology is the way in which it's redefined man. It's redefined really the rules of engagement in how we think about man. And we cannot give them that first premise. We have to reclaim, regain what a biblical understanding of man is. So so I want to start out with that very question. Why is this such an important topic, this issue of anthropology? Why is this doctrine of man something worth clinging to and clarifying? Well, I would say because anthropology tells us what composes a man. What's his composition? What motivates him? How does the environment affect him? What makes him tick? What's a properly functioning human being? All right. And so every counseling system works with an anthropology. You know, you might have a a secular counselor, a secular theorist who's never opened the Bible, but he is operating with an anthropology. He's answering the question, what's the composition of man? What motivates him? How important is the environment? All those things. They're asking the same questions, but they're getting the answers from different sources. That's right. You know, it, you, you were talking about how this has all changed. And part of it, I think, is because, oh, I don't know, the age of the Enlightenment when we all had to be scientific about something, right? And so what happened is these psychologists out there have masqueraded as, as science, if you will, and they're saying, let's use a scientific method, which is the only way you can make truth claims is if you can observe something, form a hypothesis, test it, and if you get the same result with the same conditions, that's a, you can say that's a truth claim. But they always start out with those naturalistic presuppositions, and so when they start out, they're not even taking into consideration things like what the Bible calls soul, mind, heart, redemption. Right, sin. Yeah, and that well, that gets to to a point that I wanted to ask you because you know so you mentioned this a little bit. You go read a secular textbook, for example. If you go go back and read Freud, he he's not laying out a section that says anthropology. Okay, right. If you go read Rogers, he's not necessarily laying out a section that that describes clearly definitionally who he thinks man is. He does that interwoven in his theory and how he understands people. So. Some people will say, well, surely these secular theorists don't have a doctrine of man. Well, absolutely they do. Absolutely. So, so Tim, help us to understand how they arrive at that or how theorists come up with these ideas of anthropology. I I think part of it is, you you know, they're trying to form something on the basis of observation. All right. And to understand man, you need revelation. Observation isn't going to get to, to those categories like heart, soul, mind, or sin or even God, right? Those things are ruled out immediately. And so they'll say, well, we've come to these conclusions by observation. But actually, you know, when you talk about Freud and Rogers and so forth, they all have their particular presuppositions about what man is, and they form their doctrine around those. 
we have a revelation that tells us about what makes man tick. I mean, I think about Stephen Paddock, right? The shooter who opened up on a concert crowd in Las Vegas in 2017, killing 58 people and wounding over 400, right? Well, today, it would say, well, if we could only get his brain and examine it and put it under the microscope, um, take the scientific approach, well, then we'll get answers. But it's ignoring categories like he was born warped, like all of us are, and rebellious, a captive to sin, practicing evil by habitual thoughts and practices, needing grace for change. You're not going to get that from anybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, so what they're doing essentially is they're, they're presenting a view of what they believe is wrong with him yep. or, or any person. And they're also presenting what I would term as under the category of salvation. They're presenting a means of repair. How do we, how, how does, how do we fix this guy? Yep. Right. And so they are presenting very clearly in those types of very religious terms, a, a view of the problem of man and a view of how man is repaired. But, but some people would say something like, well, well, surely by observation, we can understand man. I mean, he, he's just a neutral player in all of this as if we can understand man without God. What, what do you say to that? And, and because this is a massive question. It has implications in the way in which we practice counseling. Absolutely. So is man neutral? Can we really understand him about without understanding God? You know, some people think, okay, let's keep the God language out, and then that way we'll be neutral and uh, be able to come to some scientific conclusions. Well, the problem with that is in a God-created world, you cannot understand anything apart from God. I mean, how do we understand man? Is he... Is he man created in the image of God, or is he just man as the highest animal? And wherever you start there, you will end up proposing things and, like you say, repair, right? It depends. And, and so, is man made in the image of God? Is man a creature who's dependent on God? Man is not autonomous, if we understand Scripture correctly. He's dependent on God for his being. He's dependent on God for knowing. I mean, all of reality has to be understood with the perspective of God's revelation. Man is revelation dependent. He cannot understand the world apart from the revelation of God. Look at Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were created. They had no idea what their purpose was until God told them, right? He told them, that tree is, don't touch it, and that tree over there, that's okay. But this one, you can eat of all the other trees, not that one, okay? Well, looking at the trees, they wouldn't have understood that. So man is revelation dependent. And if you if you consider him autonomous and neutral, well, you're just going to skewer everything because in a God-created world, you have to understand everything theologically. Well, and, and don't for a second, listener, think that we're talking about some sort of lofty idea about man. Listen, this is upstream from what you want to do, which is the practice of counseling. And so if you think about the practice of counseling, you cannot help but to swim in this stream somehow in some way. And so biblically, if we are convicted Christians and we believe the Bible is true, it matters the way that we practice. It has to be consistent with what God has revealed to be true about man. So we have to ask the question and distinguish ourselves from the way that the seculars think. What is it that constitutes man from a biblical perspective? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If we don't understand that, we're not going to be good counselors. Mm -hmm. um, if we really believe the Bible is God's revelation. It reveals things to us that we would not know without that revelation. And so we need that in order to, to understand what constitutes a, a human being, what makes him tick. All those things have to be understood from the point of revelation. That's right. So when we talk about the constitution of man, we're, we're getting at what you've talked about already, which is that man has a heart. Man has an immaterial part of his being that's responsible to God. You talked about the issue of the image of God in man, and that's a part of what God is repairing. I mean, those are critical things that cannot be crossed over when we distinguish biblical anthropology. Now, we're talking about some of the things that you've delivered in a breakout session here. And, and what I want to get to is you talk in that breakout session about the oughts of life. And sometimes people are opposed to, well, we should not impose some sort of moral disposition upon people because that leads to all sorts of senses of guilt and this sort of thing. But, but these oughts in life are really important because 
These are the things that are expected from us by our creator, by the one who designed us. So what is important about these issues of the oughts that we have in life? Well, we do have to understand human beings. If we're going to understand them correctly, we have to understand human beings as, here's what I'm driving at. What ought a human being be like? Now, people who would who would suggest don't load people with oughts because that produces guilt feelings or whatever. They're also operating with oughts because they have a view of what a man should be. You can be the most secular theorist and you're operating with, this is what I think is flourishing. This is what I think is normal. And so you can't understand man without the oughts. That is to say, what should he do? How should he think? We've got to get that down. And where do you find those things? You find them in Scripture, the sufficient Scriptures. And so what ought a man to be like? What's a, what's a flourishing, normal human being? Well, we can look at Adam, the little bit that we have, see him pre-fall, right? We can see there. But primarily, we can look to Jesus, who's the perfect human being. What was he like? That tells us something about the oughts. And, and you cannot... You're, you're taking people somewhere. You can be the most secular psychologist or counselor out there, and you're, you, you're taking your counselee somewhere. Well, how do you know where to take them, right? We want them to be like Christ. And what's interesting is that in Colossians, you know, it talks about the fact that uh, salvation, Colossians chapter 3, 9, and 10, it talks about part of salvation is restoring the image of the Creator in human beings, that is, this is what it really means to be a true human, to be repaired, if you will. I love that term that you use, to, to be repaired and renewed and become like Jesus. Part of our salvation is to make us truly human. Tim, this is brilliant because th- this is the way I talk about it quite a bit is that Jesus is is normal. Now, I don't mean yeah. to, to take away from from his divinity. Certainly right. he is, right, the, the, uh, the God man, as the scripture tells us. But, but he is quintessentially what God intended humanity to be, a reflection of his character. He, we, are, we are made in the image of God, and, and Jesus did that well. He reflected, as Paul tells us in Colossians 1, that he is the image of the invisible God, right? And he does what the Father commands him tells him to do. In fact, he doesn't do anything that the Father doesn't tell him to do. So that is a beautiful picture, and that's not negotiable, right? right? So when we talk about counseling and what we ought to do, that's not negotiable. God has laid out exactly what is pleasing in his sight, the beauty of Christ and who he is. Seculars have such a difficult time describing normal. They do. They don't know what normal is. And so they're chasing after all these things that that simply try to make a person feel better. But but we in the scriptures have a, a, a picture of what's normal. And, and I think that's a really critical point. So can we understand man outside of or without finding him within the story of redemption? I think this is an important question for all of us as it relates to counseling. So how do we understand man in relation to the story of redemption? Okay, we have to understand man in, in terms of the story of redemption, because you look at what happened in the garden, okay? When you read what happened in the garden, what, what happens? You see man becomes a being who's alienated. He's alienated from God. He's alienated from other human beings, right? What does Adam do when he's confronted about his sin? He throws his wife under the bus. He says, Lord, it's, it's her. She's, it's her fault. She blames the serpent. So there's, there's alienation between human beings. There's alienation within human beings, right? We all have this conflict. And then there's alienation from creation itself. And so man is an alienated being right? Well, what's the answer to that? The answer to that is redemption, where in Christ, the curse is removed. In Christ, we're reconciled to the God from whom we were alienated, right? So unless you understand man from that perspective, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss solutions. You're going to miss understanding him. You cannot understand man apart from the category of sin and the curse. It's impossible. Now, I wish that I could somehow express to all the listeners the magnitude of what we're saying as sort of like presuppositional 
beginning point for all of us. We have to understand this because in our counseling practices, we have a tendency to drift away from what God has clearly stated is so important about man. And let me ask, just based on your last point to the listeners, does the Bible not present your experiences within that story of redemption better than any other explanation of life. Absolutely. Of course it does, right? Yeah. When, so when we think of our experiences in life, it corresponds to the biblical reality of what we experience, the devastation, the difficulty, the unwieldiness of our own heart and how we in our own power can't control it. We need something other than ourself. And God, in such a kind and gracious way, has provided that in the sacrifice of Christ. And, and what redemption and peace we have in him. Not just in him, the Bible says he is our peace, and that's what we're longing for. Truthfully, that's what settles the heart of man. And so, Tim, this has been helpful to, to re, resize this idea of man, make sure that we're always revisiting the truth of Scripture relative to man. This is a battle we'll constantly fight, but we need to be ready for and vigilant for and returning to the Scriptures to understand who man is, how he operates, and what he ought to be doing in life. That should guide and shape the way that we counsel biblically. Listening to Truth and Love, a podcast of ACBC. I'm so grateful for what Tim is is talking about here, a biblical view of the person. One of the things we must cling to is a biblical view of man. And we're seeing this unfold right now. I want to give you an update on what's going on in West Lafayette with Ordinance 3121. We've dedicated several podcasts to the issue going on there. And praise the Lord, last Monday on February 7th, that ordinance was defeated in West Lafayette, and that centered around a biblical view of person and exactly the the topic that Tim has helped us with today. And speaking of West Lafayette, that reminds me of Faith Church. I'm so grateful for Pastor Steve Vires and the whole team there, been faithfully serving the Lord in biblical counseling for years and years and years. That reminds me this week, we're going to have a team that's there at their conference where they do their annual biblical counseling training. And if you're there, there will be a couple of thousand of you there. Stop by, say hello. We'd love to to get to know you a little bit better. If you thought about pursuing certification, we'd love to have that conversation with you at the conference there in Lafayette at Faith Church. So we'd love to see you there. But as always, if you can't be at Faith Church and see us in person, you can find us on the web at biblicalcounseling.com. Mm-hmm.